are here. I am looking to start with an apology, but I have to apologize our district manager, Don Gonzalez, who's advertised. He had a family thing come up, so he had to, he couldn't be here today, but um, Shane DeForest, our associate state director from Vail District, is here to help me MC this little get together. And we call this gathering because it was 25 years ago today that we had the ribbon cutting and grant opening of this interpretive center. How many of you here? Yeah. Are here? services that it was intended. Of course, the people inside and outside the building are who have, who have made this thing work, and uh, today's celebration is really, as Sarah mentioned, about the people. We want it to be a reunion sort of a format, so you'd have an opportunity to check back in, and we also wanted to use the day to provide an opportunity to reflect backward on some of the great accomplishments that have been achieved over the years, using the, the, Bureau, the Bureau of Land Management in cooperation with the state, local, regional partners. This was a very ambitious project. Um, so please do, throughout the day and through the programs here, take an opportunity to enjoy the company of your, of your fellow Oregon Trail Center interested parties and folks, and let's keep this thing going on a little further. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a good class. <laughs> Just good morning to Oregonians, and then good morning to descendants of Oregon Trail pioneers, and to lovers of history, and most importantly, maybe, to Oregonians by choice. <laughs> As the descendants of Oregon Trail pioneers, can you imagine my excitement and the thrill of being Oregon's governor in 1992 at the opening of this interpretive center. It was so special for everyone and it felt very personal for me. And to be here again today, 25 years later, to celebrate with all of you this amazing piece of architecture on this breathtaking site depicting one of the most remarkable human feats to take place on this continent. History is meant not to sit on a shelf collecting dust, but to think about, to talk about, to share, and to learn from. has a unique collection of first-hand accounts of the Oregon Trail experience. Pioneers who traveled across this continent on the trails west, uprooted from the east and the midwest, leaving everything they had known, venturing into new territory and an unknown new life. That amazing six-month trek, long and difficult, was captured in hundreds and hundreds of diaries, 
and I will mention, written almost entirely by women <laughs> and teenage girls who were on those wagon trains. <clears throat> they recorded the challenges, the births, the deaths, the changing landscapes, the hardships, and of course, the hopes. Mm -hmm. They preserved that history of this massive migration west for all of the generations that followed. First-hand accounts have an ability to not only record history, to not only teach and educate, but to transport the reader back, back to another time, back to another place, back to another experience. My family came to Oregon on the Oregon Trail in 1853. My great-great-grandparents, James and Almeida Boggs, left Iowa that spring with a wagon full of their worldly possessions, an ox team, three children, ages 10, 8, and 4, and yet unknown to them, a baby on the way. They arrived six months later in October of 1853 to accept their donation land claim in Polk County. They arrived in Oregon having buried their eight-year-old daughter who died of yellow fever on the trail. Almeida was seven months pregnant when they reached Oregon. The child she carried inside for every mile of that arduous journey was my great-grandmother Anna the first generation of my family to be born in Oregon, born on the very first day of January, 1854. Now, so often television and movies have depicted tales of the Oregon Trail with whole families riding on the covered wagons and constant battles between the pioneers and the Indian tribes. Those films are often more about invention than reality. Because in reality, much of the Oregon Trail story <coughs> is about parties. Of course, there were dreams of reaching the so-called Eden of the West. But in order to make that dream happen, there were many sad parties. Imagine leaving behind your parents and siblings, never expecting to see them again, and your home and garden and favorite pieces of furniture and wonderful dishes and even children's toys left behind. And for six months they walked, not rode, walked across this country. And along that great trail they observed the continuous partings. Cast iron stoves, too heavy to pull any longer, left beside the trail. And beds and trunks and paintings, and cradles, and most painful of all, the grave sites. Hundreds and hundreds of them. The Oregon Trail has been described as the longest graveyard in the history of man. Painful parties with no chance to return. But I never think of the story that I am not reminded of another important element of this difficult journey. Today we might describe it as teamwork. Even though each covered wagon was like an island unto itself, carrying all its supplies and its needs, once those moving islands became part of a wagon train, they became almost a commune sharing hunting and fishing catches and carpentry skills and animal knowledge and medical needs. They birthed and buried together. They played and prayed together. And they accepted into their wagons the children, the children orphaned on the trail. These pioneers often began their journey as strangers from different states and even different countries. But they formed bonds of friendship and necessity that helped them not only reach their promised land, but to become the founders of farms and schools and towns and 
and churches and businesses. There are so many lessons to be learned from these pioneers about teamwork, about acceptance, about facing change. And as Americans, I have to say, we could also gain some lessons on endurance, on perseverance, and on shared sacrifice. History, as you know, has always been a willing and patient teacher. So here is an example as history teaches. About six years ago, my younger son and I took off for Southern Oregon on a mission of family history gathering. We were searching for the headstones of my Oregon Trail great-great-grandparents. Soon after they arrived here in Oregon, they had traded their Polk County land grant farm for a Douglas County land grant farm. I don't know how or why that happened, but it did. And we knew, or we believed, that they were buried in one of those local pioneer cemeteries in the Douglas area. But Douglas County has a number of pioneer cemeteries, some very well cared for, others that have experienced the wear and ravages of more than 150 years. My father had searched unsuccessfully for those headstones a few years before his 1990 death. We decided we would search again. My son Mark and I set out with four days off work for him and off schedule for me. We set off on this four day adventure. We spent hours in the courthouse at the Roseburg City Hall and the County Museum. We tromped through a couple of pioneer cemeteries in the August team without any success. Then finally, finally we found our family in the Civil Bend Pioneer Cemetery in Winston. We found the double headstone and the final resting place of the pioneers who had made Oregon home for the next seven generations of my family. We cleaned the large headstone, clipped away dried grass and old plants, and took out our cameras to record this moment where past and present came together for our family. History does not languish on a dusty old shelf when it becomes family. And today, we are all family. We are sharing history. We are sharing memories. We are celebrating the past. And we, many of us, I believe in this room, are very, very grateful for a future that is here, here in the so-called Eden of the West. We are lucky to be here. So enjoy and celebrate this day, make history come alive, and I would ask that you make a pledge, a pledge to understand and preserve your own history and the history of your family. Like the Oregon Trail Diaries, that history is a treasure. So happy 25th birthday to the Oregon Trail Interpreting Center. I'm glad to be home. <laughs> and uh, we did want to talk particularly about those people who volunteered to get this going. And for that, we invited um, someone who was here and worked on many of the committees and helped get it going. And um, that's Randy Gouyer, who represents the Oregon Trail Preservation Trust, Trout Tenders, and who knows how many other groups in the community. <laughs>
they brought it to where it is. Um, my uh, great grandparents uh, came across the Oregon Trail in 1877 and 78, so they were a little bit behind. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, they put it over to Boise because they lost a child. So uh, it took them two years. And then they went to Willow County, <laughs> of all places, <laughs> instead of staying in Baker County. But you know, finally we ended up here, so it's OK. Um, but this story is not about me. It's about people of Baker County, uh, the journey on the trail uh, to uh, the National Historic Oregon Trail Interpretive Center at Flagstaff Hill. That name was picked uh, by the group that put this together and our partners at BLM, but it's, it's a great name and uh, uh, it's easier to say no to. Uh, <laughs> I want to take a second now and, and uh, talk about Fred Warner Sr. Uh, back here, the World War II veteran hat man that uh, uh, Sarah mentioned. Um, he was working on getting this trail and, and preserving it far before we got on it. And he was on a statewide committee uh, in that regard and, and has uh, spent a lifetime. Of course, his ancestors came across the Oregon Trail and they were smart enough to stay in Baker County. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, anyway, Fred, thank you. about personal relationships. Um, it was about citizens in the right place at the right time and the pioneer spirit uh, to improve their lives in the future. The 1980s were hard economic times. Um, I was at the meeting, fortunately, uh, when a group of people met, uh, I think it was upstairs in U.S. Bank, uh, and kind of our leader was Gary Smith, who would uh, uh, work for U.S. Bank. And I think he also was the vice president of uh, uh, BIDC at the time, the Development Commission. Um, we had a brainstorming session as to what we could do from an economic development standpoint. And out of that uh, came a plan that we call Comebacks on the Oregon Trail. Um, from here, uh, the stars just lined up for us, and their success began. Um, I can't mention everything that happened, so if I, uh, 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 I'm going to mention a few names, but not a lot of names, because uh, there's so many people. A bunch of you are in this room, and I hope you know who you are. If I don't mention your name, don't hate me. But um, Baker County, then, uh, appointed a uh, Oregon Trail Steering Committee to work on this project idea that we came up with. That was the start. So that was our, our local government. Um, they were assigned two things. One, they were to develop a conceptual design, and two, get the funding. I mean, simple, isn't it? <laughs> you know, none of us have any money. <laughs> Not a choice. Um, the preliminary site plan and full scale was uh, for a full scale interpretive center to be managed by the BLM. Even at that early stage, uh, we had uh, uh, we had picked the BLM uh, as our partner, and they had picked us uh, to do this thing, and they had decided to become our partner. And that is a really key part of, of what happened here, uh, because the BLM has been a great partner. They have kept this. Uh, a facility, a world-class facility for all of these 25 years, and, and uh, I, I believe that they will for many years uh, uh, to come. So, uh, an important part of our uh, uh, of what we have. In uh, 1988, uh, the uh, state of Oregon jumped on the bandwagon and did a, a feasibility study and said this was an economically sound idea. Good thing to do. Well, that's what we wanted to have happen. Uh, but we kind of had people in the right place at the right time there. Uh, Mike Nelson, uh, who was a, later became our state rep or became our state representative, uh, was on the Oregon Tourism Council, and Governor Neil Goldsmith was elected as governor. And Governor Neil Goldsmith um, uh, liked us. 
and it was a relationship deal. And, uh, and he appointed Mike Nelson on the economic development uh, section of his transition team. So Mike was in place to, to, take, her, uh, to take her story at the state level. Uh, and Mike was a relationship builder. Uh, and uh, Neil had this vision about regional strategies. And he was going to uh, put a, build a fire under economic development. And he put these pots of money. I think our pot of money for our region was like $790,000. Now, the first miracle uh, that came along right then was somehow uh, we talked our neighboring area people under uh, our region uh, and Neil to give all of the money to our project. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, we, were, we must have been all those breakfasts we were eating in those meetings or something like that, whatever it was. But uh, that happened, and that was key, because then we had, we had the local support. Uh, we had the support of Leo Adler, whose room you're in today. And uh, uh, that helped us, helped us come together. At that time, uh, Gary Smith and Chuck Rouse uh, went to Washington, D.C., and I don't know, that might have been somebody else with them. Chuck Rouse is in the room today. Uh, and we all, we had relationships with Mark Hatfield, and most importantly, his key man, Jerry Frank. Jerry Frank was, has always been a friend of the center, and uh, it was a very, very significant key in uh, uh, us being successful. Uh, also, Bob Packwood and Les Coyne. Les Coyne was a great friend and uh, uh, did a great job for us. And he had a man by the name of Kevin Lynch, who was his natural resources appropriations person. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, 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 Chuck Rouse. And all he did was answer the telephone and call somebody. But, uh, uh, <laughs> The appropriations are made, you know, they, they get together in some back room and they, uh, uh, they all make presentations, they decide what they're going to do, then the chairman takes it and he decides what he's going to do out of what he saw. And, and so they came back and uh, Kevin Lance called Chuck Rouse and said, I'm sorry, uh, we had asked for $700,000, or actually only $200,000 for the preliminary study and $500,000. Uh, uh, for a detailed study, and, uh, and Kevin Lynch uh, uh, called Chuck and said, uh, "You're going to have to wait for another year." And uh, but you got an hour. And so, who do you think Chuck called? Jerry Frank. And uh, and like Chuck says, not only did we get the two hundred thousand, we got the extra five hundred thousand, and, and that's the way it went. And so friends like that, you just can't. Uh, 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 you can't see enough for them. In addition to that, Leo Adler had given $103,000 to the construction of the center. And, uh, uh, and, and so that committee then became the Oregon Trail uh, Preservation Trust. But we had a new dream. Now we were thinking, my gosh, you know, this might become a reality. We might really have a center. But what if we open it and nobody comes? <laughs> I mean, that could happen to you. And so we had a dream about marketing. And uh, Alice Trendle was right there in the, uh, 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 in the trough with us. And uh, we, uh, 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 we set a budget of a million and a half dollars to be spent in our region on marketing the Oregon Trail. Now we had a, there was kind of a, it was timing was perfect. Uh, because the following year to our opening, 1992-1993, was the sesquicentennial of the Oregon Trail. Uh, and then we decided, well, we've got to get the state kind of on board here as a committee. And so Chuck, this is uh, another Chuck Rouse idea. Uh, we formed, uh, uh, we helped them form a, a statewide Oregon, uh, Oregon Trail Coordinating Council, which worked towards the uh, sesquicentennial. And Jack Wilson and Chuck Rouse went to all those meetings and, and worked with those people to help uh, see that we got the benefit of the money. Now, there were four centers to be built in Oregon. There were no centers uh, uh, outside of the Octa Center uh, between, on, on the Oregon Trail at that time of significance. And so there were four centers uh, that were vying for money in Oregon. 
And so those uh, centers were Baker, Pendleton, uh, the Dallas, and Oregon City. Now, um, Pendleton uh, now has its Indian Center, and that's what it was to be. It was to be about the Indian history, because the Indians were very helpful to people on the Oregon Trail. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so, uh, and the Dallas was more about what you did when you got there, and it was a lot about the Indians too. And then uh, uh, there was Oregon City, which was the end of the trail. Well, um, I was at a state by meeting, and Dave was there, uh, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, let's see, Sid Johnson was there. In fact, he was chairman of the Oregon Trail Preservation Trust at the time. And uh, the state brought all of us together. And you know what those other people asked us? They wanted to know if we would slow down so they could catch up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we just, we just, uh, I mean, I, I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe that that's what they were asking us to do. And so we just kind of went next to them and, and went our own way and did our thing. And, and we were the only center that got open uh, by the Sesquicentennial Day. The, the, um, the Meyer Morrill Trust was a great friend of ours. They gave us an initial 50000 uh, But in the meantime, uh, when, we, when we formed uh, the uh, 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 Oregon Trail Preservation Trust, we realized we could not do this on our own. I mean, we all had jobs. We had to go to work at 8 o'clock and didn't get up to 5. We had to do our things. And so uh, uh, we hired uh, Fanny as our, uh, as our executive director. And she did all the work. I mean, she just kept us going all the time. And so uh, 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 anyway, we were, we were very, very fortunate to have her as our uh, executive director. So, in 1992, uh, the grand opening, uh, it was a dream come true. Uh, but the real heroes in this room today are uh, the BLM trail tenders and local marketing. And, uh, because the, we were uh, 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 the, the, the trust, even though it's been helpful afterwards, uh, uh, we were project oriented and most of those people left. And uh, they were the people left a little bit. And they have done an excellent job of keeping it together. So um, uh, I just think we can't give them enough accolade. I mean, Alice has been mentioned, uh, uh, Tim Bishop, uh, and the real challenge for our community, the challenge for us that live here today, is to continue to figure out how we best uh, utilize or tell people or get them the message about this facility because it is a world-class facility and uh, we are just so fortunate uh, to have the people that are here running it uh, doing what they're doing. Thank you.
Back in the day, Baker City was struggling to keep up with the changing economy. <coughs> it took the innovative vision of modern day pioneers who recognized the cultural importance of this place to bring its rich history back to life. Joining forces with the Bureau of Land Management, community leaders work together to create the Interpretive Center and jumpstart Baker City's growing tourism industry. Over 25 years, this community has continued to contribute to the sustained success of the Interpretive Center. From the hardworking caretakers of the center's four miles of interpretive trail to the philanthropy of individuals like the late Leo Adler, who helped sustain the center financially, of Baker City and Baker County demonstrate every day the same spirit as the pioneers they honor. In this way, the story of the Interpretive Center mirrors the very story it tells. It stands today as a living testament to the value of learning from our past. Therefore, I wish today to not only celebrate this milestone, but to encourage us all to reflect on the example set by both the pioneers of the Oregon Trail and those who continue to blaze new trails for their communities at the and I'd like to present um, these, one of these beautiful um, congressional record statements to Teresa, on behalf of the Bureau of Land Management.